Hey there, Captain Roger from the Salvation Army Grass Valley Corps. Uh, welcome to our worship and study time. Uh, you are welcome to join us in person every Sunday morning on our Alta Street location, 11 a.m. However, right now we're going to just uh, go through a little piece of scripture online. We've been working our way through the book of Matthew and we are in chapter 27. So if you've got a Bible handy, flip to Matthew chapter 27 and you will be where we are today. Let me start here. Pilate handed over Jesus. Pilate handed over Jesus. I know I usually start with an introduction that kind of teases the point and the purpose of what I'm teaching about, but I don't want that today. Instead, I want us to hear the story. It is too easy to get lost in the details of the crucifixion. I think that's partly because of what crucifixion meant. I mean, it's not just another way to kill people. In fact, it was illegal to crucify a Roman citizen. People who had seen death on a cross recognized it as a barbaric, horrifying, evil, even, method of execution. The Roman philosopher Cicero called it the grossest, most cruel, most hideous sort of execution. He said, The very mention of the cross should be far removed, not only from a Roman citizen's body, but from his mind, his eyes, his ears. It was, and is, a terrible way to die. It was designed to be a prolonged, painful, degrading, and humiliating death. There was a whole process built up around it which made it worse for the victim and which exposed them to public ridicule and shame along the way. And when people teach about crucifixion, they often devolve into what can be called a kind of torture porn. That's when the preacher begins to fancy him or herself to be kind of a horror movie, describing in gory detail everything that can be described like watching a splatter film, this is not something I want to do. The Gospels all manage to describe the event without getting too graphic, so that is my goal as well. But there are things we should know about what Jesus faced as he died. Now I'm going to try to stick as tightly as possible to what Matthew tells us with some explanation of things that may not be immediately obvious to people living in our era and culture. Are you with me? If you want or need something more, you could check out Mel Gibson's Passion of the Christ, a movie so violent that even I couldn't eat popcorn during it. And that's saying something, because I used to watch a lot of Tarantino films. And as you watch Gibson's film, just remind yourself he toned the reality down so that it would be playable in theaters. The truth is, those who were crucified would usually suffocate. As your body hangs lower than your arms, it puts pressure on your lungs, making it hard to breathe, and that in turn builds up fluid in the lungs that can't be cleared because you can't take a deep breath. It leads to more fluid, which leads to shallower breathing, and so on, until you, well, let's call it drowning. But for many people who were crucified, they were killed first, even if they hadn't quite died. And that's what's happening with Jesus. Remember that when he was convicted, and Pilate upheld that conviction and the death sentence that came with it, the governor handed him over to be flogged. That was usually the killer. Again, I'm going to avoid details. It's not a particularly pleasant description. This is not spanking or even whipping. It is flaying. The victim would usually be suffering from blood loss and would have gone deeply into shock by the time he was turned over for the rest of his punishment after this had been done. Now the rest of the punishment began with public shaming, which Jesus faces beginning in Matthew chapter 27 at verse 27, which is where we're going to meet our scripture today. Matthew 27, 27. Then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the governor's residence and gathered the whole cohort to him. All right, Pilate was the governor uh, in Jerusalem. When he was there, he stayed in the old palace of Herod the Great. And he brought his own soldiers with him as a, a ceremonial guard. There were possibly as few as two to three hundred men, but more likely it was a full six hundred plus guys in this unit. Now there were plenty of legionnaires in Jerusalem already. These guys uh, with Pilate, they pretty much just hung around with Pilate in case he needed something. And they were probably bored because, you know, no TV, right? So they took this damaged body of Jesus and they drug him into a separate courtyard for the next part, making sure that anyone coming by would be able to see what was happening to him. That was part of the deal. People needed to see so they would understand that Rome was in charge here. 
so they wouldn't cross the empire like this poor victim of uh, whatever it is that had been done, right? Usually, there would be a single designated death squad and maybe a few onlookers who would participate in an execution, but here we're told that all of the soldiers are getting involved. Like I said, no TV. Verse 28. They stripped him and put a scarlet military cloak around him, and weaving a crown of thorns, they put it on his head, and they put a reed in his right hand, and kneeling down before him, they mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews! And I know it's played up as, as physical abuse, but this was not physical abuse so much as it was just humiliation. This was part of Pax Romana, the Peace of Rome. To maintain peace in the empire, anyone who disrupted that peace was dealt with in as big and visible and brutal a way as possible. Then, should anyone think about challenging Rome, they would remember what could happen to them and they would back down. Or at least that was the thinking. Jesus, he's, he's been stripped. That shames him. He's mocked, he's called a king, he's dressed up to look like one, while the legionnaires show that they hold the power. The scarlet cape of a soldier is wrapped around him like a royal robe. Thorny vines are woven into a circle and placed on his head. And I know how that's usually depicted, but the thorns were probably not turned down to be stuck into Jesus' flesh. Instead, they were turned up to make a headpiece that looked like a low-rent version of a royal, many-pointed crown. Those spikes on a king's crown were meant to show his power and authority radiating out from him. The reed in his hand, in Jesus' hand, was a, a long wooden switch. A king's scepter was the sign of his authority, the crown was the sign of his power, and the robe was the sign of his position. So what they had done is they had dressed Jesus up like a king in his power, and then they played as if they were serving him for a few minutes before getting tired of this and getting on with their job. Verse 30, they spat on him, they took the reed and repeatedly struck him on his head, and when they had mocked him, they stripped him of the military cloak and put his own clothes on him and led him away in order to crucify him. In this way, they believed they were demonstrating their power over Jesus, just as they would demonstrate their power over anyone who had fallen into their hands for this sort of execution. Crucifixion was so normal in Roman-occupied territories that they had set places up alongside the roads and gates into the major cities so that there the condemned could be displayed as they died. In those places, poles were erected and well mounted into the ground. Those heading to their doom were given a crossbeam to carry, the cross they would be attached to shortly. Because of the flogging and the other abuse suffered by these prisoners, it wasn't unusual for them to struggle to carry that bar. But Roman soldiers had another law on their side. They could command any passerby in an occupied land to carry all of their gear for them. So when it became obvious that Jesus didn't have strength left to carry his cross, they tapped someone else to help. Verse 32. And as they were going out, they found a man of Cyrene named Simon, and they forced this man to carry his cross. Now, Mark mentions that Simon had at least two children, Alexander and Rufus, and Rufus seems to be mentioned later in Scripture in Paul's letter to the Christian church in Rome, where he had become one of the leaders of the followers of Jesus there. Just kind of an interesting side piece. Cyrene, by the way, was the name of a territory inside of what is now called Libya. And Simon seems to be the first black African mentioned in the New Testament. He is certainly not the last. But I think it's interesting that even in his dying hours, Jesus is working to draw a diversity of people to him. And Matthew wants to be sure that we understand that. Verse 33. And when they came to a place called Golgotha, which means a place of a skull, they gave him wine mixed with gall to drink. And when he tasted it, he did not want to drink it. Now, uh, women from Jerusalem would come to this place of execution and offer a mixture of wine and myrrh to the condemned. It was an effort at mercy, but kind of a mixed one. See, myrrh worked to numb the pain, which was a mercy but it could also prolong the death that was coming, which was torture. 
Matthew is working in a, a scripture reference here for us. Uh, even in these moments that seem so hopeless and bleak, he wants us to recognize that what Jesus is going through is only what has been foretold. Even when it may seem that he is about to fail, Jesus is demonstrating he is in control. The scripture in particular here is Psalm 69, 21. It's a, a verse in the middle of a prayer by a psalmist to God, crying out that he's being shamed, humiliated, and all seems lost, but that he knows God can deliver him. Matthew's pointing us to the verse that says, They also gave me gall for food, and for my thirst they gave me vinegar to drink. And we're to remember that the rest of the psalm goes on to say things like, But as for me, though I am afflicted and pained, your salvation will protect me, O God. So we can be reassured that even when it seems there is no hope, God remains, and with God nothing is impossible. Now Jesus refuses to drink the anesthesia, and the soldiers get on with their execution. They strip him naked again, they lay him back over the bar, and nail his hands into place. It was possible to crucify someone by just tying them to the beam, but Roman executioners liked to be sure that people couldn't escape. See, if they failed to kill their prisoner, they and their families could find themselves being executed for their inability to complete their duty. Um, verse 35. And when they had crucified him, they divided his clothes among themselves by casting lots. And they sat down and were watching over him there. And they put above his head the charge against him in writing, this is Jesus, King of the Jews. This was all part of the process. The soldiers had rights to anything that was left with the prisoner. Jesus didn't have much, just to whatever he'd been wearing. Matthew here again, though, is pointing us to a psalm. This one is a prayer from one who seems forsaken, who knows nonetheless that God is near at hand, and that in the end justice will be done. The author of that psalm writes, Dogs surround me, a pack of villains encircles me, and they pierce my hands and my feet. All my bones are on display. People stare and gloat over me. They divide my clothes among them and cast lots for my garment. But you, Lord... Do not be far from me. You are my strength. Come quickly to help me. As the soldiers marched the condemned through the streets, they would have them wear a placard, a board that had been whitewashed and then had the charge inked across it. As they passed through the city, everyone could see what it was that they were convicted of. And once the person had been nailed to the crossbeam and hoisted up the pole until the beam slipped into that notch cut for it, the soldiers would put that sign over the head of the dying so that everyone would be aware of their crime. Jesus was declared to be the king of the Jews, and his feet were then nailed into place as well. Verse 38 tells us that then two robbers were crucified with him, one on his right and one on his left robbers is kind of a weak translation perhaps it would be better to say brigand or rebel that was who normally earned crucifixion from the empire those who fought against them somehow the other gospel writers say more about these men but matthew's running out of room on his scroll so he's giving us only the barest description of events because he doesn't want to miss sharing anything that he thinks is really important so there's a lot of details we need to pull from other gospels but we're not going to do that today Go to verse 39. Those who passed by reviled him, shaking their heads and saying, The one who would destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, save yourself. If you're the son of God, come down from the cross. Public executions, uh, they were all about shame and mockery. Quite honestly, the same is true today. Uh, unless you believe there is a purpose to humiliation and pain, there is no reason for a public execution. These men were not hung two stories up like we see in movies, by the way. Instead, the crosses, they would have stood just a little higher than I am tall. They didn't need to be more. They were close enough, uh, the, the people who were crucified, they were close enough for passers-by to spit on them and throw trash and belittle them. And as long as they didn't touch the bodies or do anything that would risk the prisoner escaping, the soldiers generally left people alone. If Jesus hadn't been kind of a celebrity with a following, they may have just nailed him up and left him to die rather than staying around to watch. But they did. 
stay around. Verse 41 says, In the same way also the chief priests, along with the scribes and elders, were mocking him, saying, He saved others, but he's not able to save himself. He's the king of Israel. Let him now come down from the cross, and we will believe in him. He trusts in God. Let him deliver him now if he wants to, because he said, I am the son of God. Now, notice these guys aren't talking to Jesus here. Instead, what they're doing is they're using his crucifixion to evangelize their position to the crowd. But, I find this fascinating, even in doing so, they acknowledge Jesus. He saved others. That's what they're telling people. Ah, he saved others. But that's not something they had really admitted before, is it? That Jesus had saved others? Jesus saved them from illness, from brokenness, from possession, even in a handful of cases from death. These were all signs of the Messiah. They were the very signs that these chief priests and scribes and elders had denied. But now that Jesus is nailed to a cross, they feel safe acknowledging them. If this was a movie, there'd be discordant music playing to signal that we should know there's something more going on here. Do you think... Do you think that if Jesus had lifted up his head and then stepped down off the cross, freeing himself, that they would have believed in him? Or do you think they would have come up with some other reason to deny him at that point? Yeah. Look at the next verse. This is part of human nature that I have seen too many times in my life, and I hope never, ever to slip into this kind of thinking. Verse 44. In the same way, even the robbers who were crucified with him were reviling him. I mean, what's with that? All three of them are nailed to the tree, right? The death is coming for all of them. But these two guys, they turn on Jesus and they mock him along with his attackers. What kind of gain do they think they're getting from that? I, I don't get it. I pray that when I die, 375 years from now, that I go out with kind words and blessings. What kind of anger has to consume you to make you revile someone who's dying beside you at the hands of the same people who nailed you to a tree just like they did with him? Actually, I wonder if that might be it. Uh, Luke, in his gospel, tells us that while Jesus was being nailed to the cross, he prayed for the soldiers who were killing him. Father, forgive them. I suppose that might have upset the others, maybe. Jesus praying for forgiveness for the people who are nailing all of them to the these cross beams. But throughout this whole thing, take note of what Jesus does, or more specifically, what it is he doesn't do. Jesus doesn't respond to any of this, does he? The conviction is trumped up as it was. He says nothing. The beating that probably left him so physically damaged he would have died no matter what over the, the next few hours. Nothing. The mockery, the humiliation. Nothing. The cross. Father, forgive them. The invective screamed at him and about him by those who somehow believed that his death was going to make their lives better. Jesus had no response. Through it all, Jesus lived out the principles he told us we should live by, the things that he told us God wants us to do. He is choosing to live out the agape love of God for his children. Jesus made this choice to behave with kindness and forgiveness and love even for those people who were causing him great harm and killing him. I don't know. I don't know how he did that. But I do know, I want that kind of peace to reign in my life. That kind of trust that God's will is all that matters. How about you? I, mean, I know this is a, a horrible story, and we are in a terrible spot to stop telling it. It's Christmas, and I'm going to leave this story with Jesus hanging on a tree like an ornament of some kind. Well, so be it. He's the reason for the season, after all. And we are seeing him show us why, even if it shows how far most of us are from being all that God created us to be. What we really need this Christmas is to ask Jesus for the gift 
that that we need the gift of his peace even when the world around us is just a seething pit of pain and anger and hatred we need god's peace towards the end of his letter to the philippians the apostle paul advised them don't be anxious about anything but in every situation by prayer and petition with thanksgiving present your requests to God and the peace of God which transcends all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus and the peace of God that transcends all understanding Lord I want that I want your peace to to fill me up to to guard my heart to protect my mind I pray that this is something that you want as well in fact let's close by praying that God will send this transcendent peace to fill each of us and remind us that no matter what difficulties we face we can take heart because he's been there he's been there as long as we trust in him all will be well in the end that's what Jesus is trying to show us as he goes through the worst day of anyone's life. Are y'all with me on this? Can I get an amen? Yeah. Let's pray. Oh Lord, peace. It sounds like a fantasy. The idea that we could have peace in the midst of the difficulties that we face the, the midst of the trials that every one of us has to struggle through but lord you tell us that with your peace if we trust in you you will grant us that peace that we will just be able to face life on its own terms that we'll be able to go through whatever it is that is happening because we know know that in the end your justice reigns your love for us rules your peace can reign in our lives even now god we need that transcendent peace as we uh, head into this coming week as we head into this season that we have uh, entered this Christmas season, I just pray that you would uh, remind us that your peace is there. It's there for us to draw on. It's there for us to lean on. It's there for us to wrap ourselves in and help us to spread your peace rather than anger, rather than hatred, rather than war. Help us to seek out peace in all things and to trust you in all circumstances no matter how impossible they may seem to us because with you all things are possible thank you for the example of Jesus I hate to thank you for the horrible things that he's going through but thank you for the example of Jesus because I know that the worst things can get for me they don't get any worse than they were for him. And he was able to cling to your peace. I should be able to do so as well. Thank you for that, Lord. In the name of that same Jesus, we pray these things. Amen. Amen. Hey, this is important. Wherever you go, whatever you're doing, you have nothing to fear. Nothing. Because God is there. God is already there wherever it is that you go. Just go with God. Grace and peace to each and every one of you this week. See you next time.